Hello, um, today we will be discussing the major parts of the brain and their functions. So let's get started. What are the objectives that we are going to cover in this PowerPoint? First off, we're going to understand what the brain is and then the major divisions mm -hmm. of the brain, structure and function of the brainstem, brainstem cerebellum, diencephalon, basal nuclei, and cerebrum. So first off, what is the brain? The brain is part of the central nervous system along with the spinal cord. It is a marvelous design that was created to set us apart from other living things. Our brain consists of about 85 billion, with a B, neurons with many more synaptic connections. Being able to regulate homeostasis without having to think about it, experience heartbreak and joy, voluntarily move our bodies, be aware of what's happening around us, Think through a math problem and retrieve a memory from your seventh grade from your seventh birthday party are all functions of our brain. The brain is a well-oiled machine, meaning if one part does not do its job correctly, the effect will be seen somewhere else in the brain or down the line because no part of the brain works individually from one another. The brain can be broken into three major parts, starting from the most inferior, meaning toward the bottom. We have the brain stem, and moving up, we have the cerebellum and the forebrain. The brain stem is the support for the cerebellum and also the cerebrum. It is also the first contact with the peripheral nervous system because it's connected to the spinal cord and the spinal cord sends out from there. The cerebellum sits behind the brain stem and is important for motor control. The forebrain is part of the brain that you usually think about when someone says the word brain. This large grooved organ that takes up space in our skull. Our forebrain is what's going to make up most of our brain. Our higher functions of our body occur in the forebrain, things like emotions and problem solving. So the brain stem consists of the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the, hang on, let me move that out of the way, sorry, and the midbrain. The brainstem controls vegetative functions. They require no thought in order to occur. The medulla oblongata is most inferior and extends from the bottom of the pons to the beginning of the spinal cord. The medulla consists of multiple nuclei and is the passageway from the spinal cord to higher parts of the brain, and it is vital in regulating our heartbeat, our breathing, and our blood pressure. The pons is medial to the midbrain and the medulla, and it bulges out slightly. That is that blue section in the picture. It is a merging point for several cranial nerves. Our pons is going to influence the sleep cycle, manage pain signals, and it's a connection to other parts of the brain as well. The midbrain is at the very top, that red section highlighted there. It contains lots and lots of nuclei, and it's able to control uh, our heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and most importantly, level of consciousness. Hello? Oh, we're not switching. Oh, there we go. Alrighty, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is about the size of a baseball. It sits underneath the occipital lobe and the brain stem. It is known as the little brain and it is important in motor control, coordination, balance, and muscle tone. There are about four times the number of neurons in the cerebellum than in the entire brain, indicating that this is a very special part of our brain. The cerebellum consists of three main parts that each control subconscious activity. The first part is the vestibulo cerebellum, which is a key player in balance and eye movement, and it is located in interior of the cerebellum and is actually quite small. It's just that little green nodule in that picture. It kind of extends the, the length of the cerebellum. The next section is called the Spino cerebellum, which enhances muscle tone, coordinated skill, and voluntary movement. Excuse me. 
Think about all the muscles that need to work together in order to simply pick up a, pick up a book. Your spinocerebellum is responsible for all of that coordination. I would compare it to almost like a district manager of a corporation's branch. Ultimately, the CEO of a company will decide what's going to happen, i.e. the picking up of the book. And the district manager, which would be the spinocerebellum, makes sure that the people in his branch are working together to get that task done. The spinocerebellum makes sure that all of the muscles that need to work together in your arm pick up that book correctly in order to not damage your body. Excuse my dog. The last part of the cerebellum is the cerebrocerebellum, and it is a key player in planning and initiation of voluntary activity by being an input to the cortical motor areas. This part, this part is also going to store procedural memories, so things that we do over and over and over again. The diencephalon is a structure that is inferior to the brain. It sits superior to the midbrain, and it is made up by two main parts, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The thalamus is a gateway to the cerebral cortex. It is the coordinator of our brain. So the thalamus is going to send and receive signals, and it's almost going to screen them to decide if they're important or not, and if they need to be sent forward. It plays an important role in sleep, and sensory systems. Our second major player, which is the hypothalamus, is situated just below our thalamus, hypo meaning below, and it is going to control functions that are important for maintaining the stability of our internal environment, also known as homeostasis. This is things such as body temperature, hydration, and salt concentration, food intake, pituitary hormone secretion, uterine concentration, and milk I'm sorry, uterine contractions and milk ejections, the autonomic nervous system coordination, which would be your smooth and cardiac muscle, emotional and behavioral patterns, and finally, our sleep-wake cycle. Our hypothalamus is a very busy part of our brain. You can see here the pituitary gland is included in this diagram. Um, some texts will include the pituitary gland and the penile gland. Others will leave them out of the diencephalon. But you can see here that our diencephalon is our um, endocrine glands that are going to secrete hormones um, on the interior part of our brain. The basal nuclei are a group of subcortical sub nuclei and is part of our forebrain. This area sits lateral to the thalamus and is a core part of our brain. Think about the layers of our earth. The core is the inner part of our earth. Similarly, the basal nuclei are, the, are part of the inner part of our brain. The basal nuclei are responsible for sending and receiving large amounts of information due to the very, very astronomically large number of fibers that are linking these nuclei to other sections of the brain. Some of the movement that is controlled here includes inhibiting muscle tone throughout a body, our body, selecting purposeful motor activity and suppressing unnecessary patterns of movement, and monitoring and coordinating slow sustained contractions that are related to posture and support. So we're moving on to the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into two halves, the left and right hemispheres. These hemispheres are connected to each other via the corpus callosum, which is an area containing 300 million neuronal axons. That's a lot of axons. It's almost like a super highway for our neurons to connect our two halves. I live in Florida and we have the Florida Keys, this little stretch of islands off of the bottom of our state. And the only way to get into and out of the Keys is using the roadway US1. And this is kind of how our corpus callosum is going to work in our brain. Okay. The only way in and out of the Florida Keys is this one road that's lots and lots of traffic. The communication between the left and right hemisphere um, between the corpus callosum is the way for our neurons to communicate with each other from one side of our brain to the other. That is why there's so many axons here because nerves are traveling very, very fast. I'm sorry, signals are traveling fast. 
The right hemisphere is going to control the left side of our body, and it's going to um, involve more creative and artistic talent, a more holistic view of the world. It is going to be our non-language type of skills. Our left hemisphere is going to control the right side of the body, and it is more analytical, more logical. It breaks things down step by step. Um, these are kind of what you've heard about if you've ever heard, oh, I'm a left brain person or I'm a right brain person. Um, it has to do with how you're thinking through things in this world, whether you're really logical or if you're very creative. Cerebral matter is an important topic to cover as well. So the entire cerebrum is covered by a thin layer of gray matter. You can see that outer darker pinkish color in this picture here. That is our gray matter. It is also known as the cerebral cortex. Underneath of our cerebral cortex is our white matter. Gray matter is made mostly of our neuronal cell bodies and our dendrites, while our white matter has a very high lipid concentration due to the fact that it's got lots of bundles of axons, and our axons are covered in a myelin sheath. That myelin sheath is what's going to add to our lipid concentration. Okay, our cerebral cortex. We can break our cerebral cortex up into many different sections. It is responsible for our voluntary movement, sensory perception, um, conscious thought, language, personality, um, and our intellect is all found within our cerebral cortex. We can separate this gray matter into lobes based on two main groups, grooves. The central sul sulcus and the lateral sulcus are deep grooves that are going to divide our brain into four sections. Starting out most anterior, we have the frontal lobe, which namely sits behind the frontal bone of our skull. This lobe is responsible for decision making, problem solving and planning, as well as speaking and voluntary movement. The parietal lobe lies posterior to our central sulcus and is under the parietal bone. It acts like an integrator of central uh, information by receiving and processing input um, from our sensory neurons. The temporal lobe is responsible for receiving auditory signals or sensation. Think temporal tempo. When you're listening, when you're listening to music, there's a tempo to that music. You have to listen to it to find the tempo. Your temporal lobe is everything auditory, as well as some memory, language, and emotion. This lobe is located inferiorly to the lateral sulcus, meaning it is positioned to the sides of the head, but it is superior to the cerebellum. The last lobe we're going to discuss is the occipital lobe, found posteriorly, and it's going to carry out visual processes. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, but this line right here that I'm drawing with my mouse is where our lateral sulcus is. It's going to divide kind of top and bottom. And this line that I'm drawing right here is going to divide front and back. That is our central sulcus. So this is a very basic breakdown of our cerebral cortex. We can further break down our four lobes into many different regions. And we can break them down into their specific function of what they do for our body. Maybe it's um, developing speech and maybe some of its understanding speech, maybe it's primary sensory, primary motor, all of those things can be broke down even further than just our four lobes. But to get through all that information, we'd have to save that for another lecture. Here are my sources. Hopefully y'all learned a thing or two and enjoyed this presentation. Um, have a blessed day. Thank you.